All right, here we go. Let's, um, so once again, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this gathering online, uh, for family gathering around the world. Father, friends, old and new, I thank you that uh, ears are anointed to hear, hearts are good ground. Yes. Speak through Connie and I. Fathers, we pour out from your heart. Um, uh, let what we say be um, edifying. Let it be um, bring glory to you and advance heaven's cause. Speak through thank us and think through us, God. We decrease now so that you may increase. Bless each one. God, some are hurting tonight. Some need comfort in lots of areas, not only in the subject we're talking about. We declare great peace on them. Thank and no weapon formed against this time shall prosper. In Jesus' name. In Jesus amen. Name. amen. 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 All right, here we go, guys. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. This is um, a Quarantine Encouragement. I believe this is Volume 4. Uh, we've been doing these. Uh, my Volume 4, I know Connie's done mm -hmm. some. Um, you know, on her own, different things that God has put on her heart. This is a teaching that I had wrestled with for a while, didn't know. It had kind of come into my spirit like two or three weeks ago, and I thought, I'm not going to teach on that. I'm not going to teach on that. And I really feel that I should. So I know it's 10 o'clock. I know it's late. Uh, we had things that we had to do tonight. We had other prayer calls and things we had to handle, thus the lateness of the hour. And also our spiritual mom had something going on that we wanted to support. And so, I, you know, I saw somebody saying, hey, I'm staying awake. Uh, stay awake, mm -hmm. you know. I, um, for some of you, it's just 7 o'clock. You just finished dinner. Uh, for others of you, it's late night. And it is kind of a late night subject. Uh, and you know us. We're going to speak kind of graphically and, and uh, uh, not so pornographically. Yeah, so kids should be down. Yeah, so or, be down, yeah. uh, or, you know, uh, this is for adults only for sure. But if you're married, single. And I would even say if you're if you're old enough to be on Facebook, I think you got to be on Facebook at 16, I think is the age to be on Facebook. You know, uh, for youth, uh, porn is a big deal. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe people have questions. Maybe people have struggles. Maybe deal, people deal with guilt. Maybe they deal with curiosity. Uh, maybe even some sort of, um, you know, difficulty uh, that they've encountered from it. Uh, this is for you as well. So uh, please, I'm going to ask one more time, if you would, if, you, if you're interested in sharing, uh, this is going to be something that uh, it's just going to be um, hopefully from the heart of God. It's some things that are on my heart to share and I believe you'll be blessed. So if you don't mind, click and share. Again, um, just for as many people to be able to join us. Invite friends in, invite a watch party, whatever you want to do, because uh, we're going to be sharing from the Word um, tonight. So uh, here we go. So I saw right before quarantine in the States, right before the shelter-in-place orders, and Connie's going to be kind of on my, yeah, gonna, on my ones I'm and twos here. Yeah, I'm doing some technical so. uh, IT stuff, so this should be fun. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So... Um, I saw uh, that uh, one of the largest porn sites in the world uh, was giving free premium memberships to Italy, uh, to everybody in the nation of Italy, uh, because they were all sheltered in place because of all the deaths and the things that were hitting uh, the Lombardy area and, of course, throughout the country. And I remember reading that, and it really struck me that when people are in isolation, and here comes the boredom, the disconnection, um, the, the slowing down... Um, and then the mind becomes open. They used to say an idle mind is the devil's workshop. I don't know about that. Sometimes an idle mind can be engaged in healthy contemplation. But I remember reading that, that, you know, they were saying, look, we know you're stuck at home. We know you've got, you know, time on your hands. Well, here's something else you can do with your hands. And we're going to give a, what, what, <laughs> uh, we're going to give a, we're going to give you access to the porn, the, the, all the porn you want. And uh, again, uh, that kind of, affected me because I thought, wow, look at that. And so, of course, you know, those of you that know Understanding TV, that's always on demand uh, 24 hours a day for free all the time all over the world. And so I really began to push it. I was like, yeah, you know, you're bored and you want something to entertain or some sort of diversion. You could click to porn, but you could also click to the Word. And these, I don't know how many hundreds of hours, uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours of teachings we have. And people began to respond and say, yeah, I'm watching that because when my mind starts to drift and I don't have something to occupy my mind or my energy... This, this is what I'm this is what I'm switching to so we're hearing a lot of testimonies of people watching UTV understanding TV uh, pulling up the messages people that have never heard of it before uh, stumbling into it and so this kind of got me thinking and I've watched over and over again not only what I saw the largest porn site or one of the largest porn sites in the world do by by pushing its content during quarantine I also saw uh, that a lot of the comedy a lot of the stand-up com comedians a lot of the online comedians even on Saturday Night Live uh, they had one on Saturday Night Live a couple of weeks ago, the live during quarantine. We were watching with the kids, and they did a whole skit on how these women were wearing out their vibrators, just going through vibrators, burning all the batteries out because they're masturbating so much. Uh, they uh, had a skit on just this past week. I was watching it with my kids. I was like, oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, yeah, where it was like, um, uh, you know, uh, during these times, it's so difficult to get together, but we're glad that you're there for us, and we're there for you, da-da-da. And it was like by Pornhub, and it was, a, it was a sketch. It was a bit, a comedy sketch about... Uh, how Pornhub and pornography is there for us. 
uh, during this difficult time. So again, this thing I'd been pushing off, not saying, it kind of came that into my mind, you know, this is something that needs to be said. Uh, I remember seeing an Amazon employee uh, uh, doing, I don't know, a press conference or a video or whatever, being upset because he's like, look, we, you know, sending out toilet paper or soap or hand sanitizer, we should be risking our lives for that. That's essential. But he said the amount of vibrators and dildos we're sending out is not essential. So it is, what's happening is a phenomenon, and I, and I know it's not happening just in the non-Christian world. It's happening uh, in many places where uh, in the absence of the work, in the absence of the preoccupation with schedule, um, you're really the sexual being, the nature of us that is sexual, the nature of us uh, that we are all created as sexual beings, whether we're attached to that side of us or not, uh, it does find itself idle. And there's some odd cycles that are entering in now where uh, desires for pleasure uh, or, or appetites for sexual release and orgasm are being um, overtaken, or, or those the appetite for se uh, sexual release, the desire for the pleasure of sexual release, is overtaking the rhythms of natural desire. And in that gap now, porn provides, um, porn is more than happy to provide a service. So, uh, I, I, you know, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna just make my small contribution to this to share the things that I believe are relevant to you. Uh, as, as a pastor and Connie and I, um, you know, we're just gonna do our small part. So we're gonna cover like five areas tonight uh, one, two, three, four, five, and I'll, I'll, I'll you know, kind of keep you in line, uh, uh, up to date as we're progressing. Connie's hopefully going to post some notes as we go, uh, but I just want to lay this foundation. There's a lot we're not going to know about this pandemic on the medical side or any other side until, um, until uh, we've had a maybe three, six, nine months, uh, maybe years to really know what happened. We're even finding out that people were dying long before that. Not only have deaths concerning Corona have been mis. Uh, identified, but deaths in general. So we, we're really not going to know the scope of it. And I don't think we're going to know the scope of it as it relates to sex and sexuality and porn for a long time, because there are people that are picking up um, uh, and opening themselves up to things now during this quarantine uh, that are going to have echoes. And so people that have never gotten into porn and, and people that have never watched it or people never watched it on a, on a large scale or people that kind of never gave themselves into that, into that idea and that suggestion uh, maybe opening up with some things. And it's very important to me uh, that this teaching tonight and what comes out of this, I don't want to empower the enemy on either side of the, on either side of the equation. Uh, my bottom line, and we'll get to this, hopefully we'll arrive at this place in a very natural progression, but my bottom line is I don't believe pornography uh, really in any form, softcore, uh, hardcore, middle of the road core, as a single person, a married person, I don't believe it is indicative or representative of God's best. I don't believe um, it is uh, a part of God's intention for a whole life. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I'm not really against sex work, and I'm not really against sex workers in a free society. Uh, I believe sex work should be legal. I believe uh, it should be legal. I believe sex workers should be uh, have a right. I believe people should have a right to patronize sex work, but this... Uh, to engage in sex work and to patronize sex work, but in the Christ-honoring perspective, I don't believe porn is in harmony with that renewed mind, in harmony with that Christ-honoring perspective. So uh, I don't want to empower the, the enemy on, on either side. Number one, I don't want to teach this message tonight and, and uh, in a manner to empower shame, that when you hear what I say, I don't want to add my voice to the accuser, the brethren, and bring shame into your life. Uh, I don't want to empower any expectation of the curse, I don't want to teach this and start telling you, uh, you know, and if you watch porn, this is bad, it's going to happen. If you bring porn into your marriage, this, mad, this thing bad is going to happen. Uh, and if you watch porn and you find yourself sick later, or if you can't get an erection later, this bad thing's going to happen. Because I don't, I, my goal here is to not partner with the devil and to, to speak uh, or to come into agreement with an expectation of the curse. You know, people watch porn um, either uh, by themselves uh, as a single person, or maybe you watch it as a married person, hide it from your spouse, the guilt and the shame that comes along with that. I don't want to become a part of the echo of the, the enemy's voice uh, telling you, you know, these bad things are going to happen, or you're going to disconnect. Uh, maybe you watch it together as a couple, and maybe, uh, you know, you're, you're experiencing some disconnection, or, or maybe you're realizing that it's becoming a matter of dependent, maybe you're becoming emotionally uh, or mentally dependent upon it. Some people watch porn and find they're not able to function sexually in the real world. Uh, or maybe you watch porn and porn has turned to a thing, which has turned to a thing, and now maybe with uh, camming or or uh, you know becoming in fans only type stuff, or or maybe even merging into prostitution. I this is not meant to shame, I, and it's not meant to 
announce the curse in your life. It's the same thing I told my children about drugs and alcohol. I said, look, you know, you, you know, I, it would be the will of your parents that you, you know, uh, have a healthy reverence for drugs and alcohol. That you know, they're, that that if God is first in your life and that you are whole uh, and that you're you're you know you're not using it as an idol and you're not using it as a crutch and you're not using it as a compensation and it doesn't become your uh, pursuit. Uh, you know, wine wine can be enjoyed, uh, but it ought not ever be put to a place where it becomes the first thing. If God is the first thing, then the second things find their place, and they're never an idol, they're never a crutch. Uh, but, you know, with porn, I don't know if there's a biblically healthy way to enjoy porn like there is to have a glass of wine. Or I don't know if there's a biblically healthy and a Christ-honoring perspective way to have porn as part of our lives as there would be champagne at a wedding or as there would be a daiquiri on a cruise or things like that. So, so I, I want to be real clear that while my, my persuasion is that in a free country, porn uh, should be legal, the, the production of it, uh, as long as it protects children, as long as it's done uh, in, in an equitable way uh, and not an ex, uh, exploitive way, as long as sex workers are protected and there's standards in place, I believe it should be able to be purchased. I believe sex work should be legal. But the Christ-honoring soul who exists in a fallen world as strangers and pilgrims passing through Babylon, that's the position that I'm coming from tonight. But I don't want to empower shame. I don't want to empower the curse. And I don't want to prophesy negativity over your life. Uh, you know, that it's going to ruin your sex life. It's going to ruin your marriage. It's going to destroy your trust and blah, blah, blah. A lot of the issue with porn is the destroyed trust uh, in a marriage, the insecurity. Why not me? Why can't you do it without? What's wrong with this? What do you want out of it? What am I not representing? And I don't want to open a crack for the devil to come in and start whispering to you. I believe that if you're born again, you're above it. I believe that if you're born again, you're not in bondage. I, I, I don't prophesy negativity over you. And I would never tell my children, you know, uh, if you try drugs one time, it'll ruin your life. Or if you drink, you know, your granddaddy and great granddaddy and great great granddaddy were an alcoholic and it'll ruin your life. Some people can touch it and da da da. Uh, uh, and, you know, you do that and you'll, you'll OD and you'll die. I would never speak that over them. What do I say? I say it's the will of the Father that nothing has mastery over your life. But I believe that heaven forbid you ever find yourself where you've lost or you find yourself where you're feeling trapped. I want my children to know that even in the worst situation possible, if you call upon the Lord, he is a deliverer. That you may back yourself into a corner, but grace is always there to bring you out. So I don't want you to hear this and feel like, oh man, and don't buy the stuff. You've opened up the door to the devil and the, you watch porn and the devil's going to come after your children and blah, blah, blah. So I don't want to empower the enemy on that side of the equation. But at the same time, I don't want to empower the enemy for you to look at something that I believe is contrary uh, to the sum of scripture and say, well, man, if he's not going to speak for the devil, then there must be nothing wrong with it. I'm, I'm saying I believe porn is contrary to the sum of scripture. I believe porn is out of harmony with the will of the spirit uh, for our lives. I believe porn is ill-suited to our best relational and emotional and physical health. So I don't want to give the enemy uh, uh, wind in his sails to accuse you, shame you, or prophesy negativity. But I also don't want to give the enemy wind in your sails to lead you into something that's contrary uh, to what I believe is the will of the Father, what I'm persuaded by scriptures in harmony or out of harmony with the will of the Father for your life. I believe the observation of, of, of uh, things that are not yours, bodies that are not yours, uh, the observation, the exploitation of people for lust and for sex. Um, and, uh, and I'm just writing a note here that I've got to get to, sorry. Uh, I believe those things are not the will of the Father, and I believe they're contrary to God's best for our life. So here we go. Uh, in my humble, as humble as I can be, with as much sympathy and compassion as I have, let's go to number one. Five points, number one. Here we go. Uh, let's get into it. Um, at the root of porn's popularity and appeal, all right, at the root of it, uh, is the very, very real and very human desire for sexual release or orgasmic uh, uh, ecstasy. Uh, the, God invented orgasms. He invented orgasms for us to have in a partnered or non-partnered capacity. We can have them through sex, uh, be that in a marital context, intercourse. Uh, that could be via intercourse, via outer course, uh, via manual stimulation, oral stimulation. Uh, it can be vaginal, it can be anal, it can be uh, um, um, uh, mutual masturbation, uh, all these different ways. It can be with toys or enhancements and that orgasm and the sexual release that's associated with it is pleasurable and it is of God. And in a single context, in a non-partnered context, it can be done uh, with masturbation, uh, be it with anything, you know, be, by a manual stimulation or by a toy or even by something as innocuous as a pillow or or a washcloth or, you know, a, a, it could be 
Uh, the handle, you know, the handle of a toothbrush, it could be anything that's used or uh, even fruit, you know, people have used fruit in their, uh, in their cabinets or things like this. So, so the capacity for orgasmic release, either with a partner or uh, on, in a solo context, is something that is available to us as humans and it's connected to our creation, that God invented sex, God invented orgasm, God invented ejaculation, he invented the uh, um, uh, a pleasure associated with it and it exists even in a non-procreative context. It's not something that um, you have to be wanting to procreate to happen because it can happen independently of it and sex is even possible, orgasm is even possible when it's not possible for a female to be uh, uh, getting pregnant or while she's pregnant, the capacity for pleasure continues. It does not come and go based on uh, procreation. I believe that our capacity for sexual pleasure uh, is uh, divinely connected to our capacity for connection, that we connect either in a simple way with God or we connect in a complex way with a partner and that expressing sexuality in the context of connection, dynamic connection, is something that is the will of God. But now we're kind of put out here as sexual beings into the world uh, where sometimes very early on, three, four, five, people are awakened to their sexual, uh, their sexual, their sexuality, uh, that sexual nature, or maybe even into prepubescence, uh, early teen years, some people much later on, they stumble into masturbation, they stumble into the pleasure, not only the pleasure of self-touch, the relaxing pleasure of self-touch, which many people knew as a child, uh, but eventually they stub stumble into the orgasmic uh, uh, pot of gold at the end of the self-touch rainbow, and this is a milestone that many people uh, across. Um, you know, some uh, 90, 95, 98 plus percent of men have masturbated uh, by the time they're 18, 24 years old. Maybe a little bit later, 24, 30 year old uh, for women have at one time or another engaged in self-pleasure. And for some people, because of the foundation that it's very nasty, very bad, very evil, some people shy away from it or feel dirty. Some people embrace it because they like the pleasure but feel negative consequences. Sometimes there's bad teaching uh, that tells us, you know, we're of God or not of God, we're demonic, etc. But some people stumble into it and pursue it with all their might, pursue it with all they have. And porn is often there to assist. Porn is often there to bolster. Uh, um, and, and I think at the point that it violates that divine connection, at the point that it violates the honor between a partnered uh, uh, pair, it's at that point of the inclusion of others. It's at that point that it becomes exploitive. And it's at that point it crosses out of the healthy expression that God uh, wants us to have for our sexuality. So... Um, sexual release, now we're still in number one here, uh, is a product of our bodies and brains. That our bodies and brains, when they work well and function in concert, um, in, in a sexual context, we end up with sexual release. And this is in a four-layer cycle. A is desire. Desire coming first, uh, uh, and then followed by arousal, uh, followed by stimulation, and then followed by release. So I want you to think about that a tinge, a, a ping, a, a hint of sexual desire. That desire is mental. Uh, it, it comes from the positive and unencumbered thought flow. If you have a healthy sex concept, you're sex positive, uh, you're, there's a feeling of aboveness. This desire comes uh, and that triggers arousal, arousal being internal, uh, coming out of the flow of pro proper flow of blood and hormones. Um, and then uh, that arousal seeks stimulation. Uh, sometimes when kids are young, they'll just touch uh, sometimes they'll touch through a pocket. Sometimes they'll grind. Sometimes they'll rub against something. And what they're doing is that that desire has kicked in an arousal. That arousal is now seeking a stimulation. Uh, and out of that, if it's taken out to its natural course, it ends up in a release, uh, the climax of the orgasm, and the climax now being the combination of the psychological and the physiological. Okay, so you're getting all mm -hmm. these loaded in. All right, here we go. So um, now, point two, and we're going through these five points. Um, so the second point now uh, is this. So, uh, uh, so sexual release, what comes before sexual release is the stimulation. So there's an orgasm, but before there's an orgasm, there's a stimulation. The stimulation uh, needed to climax is related inversely to the level of desire and arousal. That's very important. If desire is very high and arousal is very high, it only takes a little bit of stimulation. If desire and arousal is very high, it takes a little bit of stimulation. If desire and arousal is low, it takes a lot of stimulation. So in a masturbatory context, um, you know, um, you can, uh, if, 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 if it's been a few days since you've masturbated or maybe a week or two since you've masturbated, that means your desire tank is really replenished. Arousal at the point that you become aware and engaged sexually 
uh, arousal is probably high. It does not take necessarily a lot to stimulate yourself to orgasm. Uh, I don't know if, I think I told Connie about this. Many of you may know about it. They had that article about the, uh, I think it was a 14-year-old that OD'd on Viagra. He took his dad's Viagra. I think I told you about that. Yeah, this 14-year-old OD'd on Viagra. He took like six of his dad's Viagra, wound up with third-degree burns on his hands. It was really bad. So anyway, um, that was a joke. Okay, so, um, so, uh, <laughs> it's, it's true, but I was that kid. So, um, so what happens is, um, let's say, let's say a woman masturbates, um, you know, every, every 10 days or twice a month or something like that. Well, in, in, in the, in, in that prolonged period, the desire builds, which means when her mind engages sexually, the, uh, um, arousal is, is running hot, which means the stimu because the arousal and desire are high, the stimulation needed to get her over the top is very low. But if that same woman masturbates three times a day, that three times a day will deplete that natural rhythm of that desire. It will deplete that natural arousal, which means the stimulation must be more intense. So she may masturbate, or a young man may masturbate, um, to the point where there's even injury. Uh, I mean, you know, um, you know, you could bust a vein or, or uh, rub the po to the point of rawness or something like that, or uh, use a toy to the point of being hurt, or, um, and there are even cases where people have pulled a muscle, and what are they doing? They're putting extra intensity, extra contractions, extra uh, uh, emphasis, extra uh, straining to achieve that release by intensifying the stimulation. Why the demand for intense stimulation? Because the, the, the increased frequency is driving the desire and the arousal down, so the intensity of the rubbing or the jerking or the pulling or whatever they have to do uh, uh, has to be uh, amped up. So in pursuing that release now, so you have the orgasm the release, what leads to that orgasm is the stimulation. What precedes that stimulation is the arousal. What precedes that arousal is desire. But there's something that comes before all that. Before there's a desire or an arousal or a stimulation or a release, there's a point of engagement. There's a point at which the mindedness, mindedness of the sexual creation, the consciousness, the awareness, the remembrance that I am a sexual being gets engaged. And when that idea inside me gets engaged in the middle of my routine life, that can trigger desire, that can trigger arousal, that can trigger stimulation, that can trigger release. Now, listen to this. As human beings, we are sexual beings at all times. But by design, our, sexual, uh, our sexuality is given preeminent, uh, preeminent selectively, which means I'm a sexual being 24 hours a day. I, I am a person who enjoys pleasure that God wired to enjoy pleasure, 24 hours a day, I have the capacity for orgasm, I have the desire for orgasm, and, and, and it is hardwired to who I am. That's the way God made me. When God closed his eyes, he thought, you know what, I'm gonna invent a penis, and, and uh, it'll have a really sensitive head and tip, and it'll have a built-in sleeve that will go over the head and sensitize the little chin and the corona, and, and if it's done enough time, uh, uh, and, and the man's mind is engaged, it will trigger a, a involuntary reaction and an ejaculation that is intentionally pleasurable. It'll ripple throughout the man's body, and all of this is my idea. And with a woman, I'll put, uh, I have a clitoris, uh, which has the clitoral hood, the clitoral head, the wings, the bulbs, which uh, when it's stimulated on the outside, you know, wax on, wax off, it's stimulated that way, or through penetration and through the opening, the vaginal opening, the stimulation uh, of the vaginal entrance, inside into the backside of the clitoris, the, the G spot, all the way into the anterior, posterior fornix, the stretching, the fullness, all these things, uh, the stimulation of the nipples, all of these things, uh, when the woman's mind is engaged, can lead to that uh, uh, similar, not orgasm singular, but orgasm plural. So God made us like that, and we exist like that 24 hours a day, but we have the ability to selectively give it the preeminence. Why? So that it does not become our sole dominant form of self-feeling and expression that we are not just walking around jizzing all the time, that we're not just walking around jacking off and jilling off all of the time, that we're not just walking around and screwing like rabbits all the time because uh, our, our lives are more than, our existence is more than just our sexual being. We are creators, we are innovators, we are contemplators, uh, we are thinkers, we are problem solvers, we are producers, we have our work as a gift from God and that work, that process, those things that we are in, uh, uh, engaged in uh, those things uh, are part of us as well. You're not just a sexual being. But when we go through our life, our sexual engagement happens, and the point at which our routine, uh, our normal routine non-sexual impulses and pursuits 
cross over to sexual impulses and pursuits. So you could be driving down the road, and, and we use the phrase, and I felt horny out of nowhere, or I had a sexual thought out of nowhere. And at the point that your mind stills enough to pay attention to that, your mind gets engaged, it remembers, it reconnects, it becomes reconscious. Oh, you know what? I'm not only a guy that makes stuff at, at Spacely Sprockets or at Coswell Cogs. I'm not only a lady who works on the chocolate line there with Lucy and Ethel. I, I'm also a person with a vagina. I'm also a person with a penis. I'm also a person that uh, likes to ejaculate. I'm also a person that likes to masturbate or I like oral sex or I like uh, uh, having intercourse with my spouse or a, a woman may say, I like the fullness of penetration for my husband. And at the point that the mind accepts that and engages, it tinges a ping of arousal. It, it, uh, of desire. And that desire, if that thought continues, starts to communicate physiologically and hormonally to the body, and now here comes arousal. But now we're often limited because when this happens, we're not always in a place where we can stimulate, and we're certainly not always in a place where we can uh, take it to the uh, place of completion. So here it is. When our God-given preoccupation with work, productivity, did you put this one in here? That's what I was just yeah. realizing. Can I show you what three, you, this one right here? Oh, there we yeah. go. Uh, do you mind? Because uh, this is going to be a long statement. Yep. Connie's really helping me. I thank you. Uh, you, just, uh, you help me. I'll help you later, I promise. Um, <laughs> I'm listening to everything you <laughs> yeah, You're making notes. Uh, all right. So when our God-given preoccupation with work, this is coming in your notes right now. It's be on your screen. When our God-given preoccupation with work, productivity, contemplation, growth, whether it's intellectual, spiritual, or emotional, our God-given preoccupation with play, with recreation, relaxation, even with eating and drinking, food and sleep, uh, when we pause that to enjoy and indulge our sexual release, we're now engaged. So, so we, we become engaged now, and this idea of engagement can happen in any place. You can wake up in the morning as a man with an erection, and sometimes that involuntary erection, these nocturnal uh, erections happen, but you wake up in the morning, they call it morning wood or whatever, that kind of a thing, and you wake up and you were, you were thinking about getting on with the day, but you wake up hard. Uh, and sometimes you not only wake up hard, which is physiological, but your mind will shift to something desirable, uh, 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 something, uh, some sort of desire and some sort of arousal, and now that erection may seek stimulation. So there are women that wake up, uh, and in that morning of stillness, they just wake up and they're connected. Uh, sometimes we wake up, we hit the ground running, we got to get the alarm, we got to get the kids, we got to get to go, we got to get to the bus, we got to do what we got to do, and we don't have time to allow the engagement to, to fully plug in. But sometimes we wake up and our, and our, and our minds are engaged and the dominoes follow. The, the desire, uh, uh, the arousal, the stimulation, and the climax, and whether that's partnered or solo. Again, just laying a foundation. Uh, this can happen in the work day. It can happen working out. It can happen walking down the street. Uh, and, and it can be by a thought uh, that you think, just uh, 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 something flashes through your mind, an image that you see, a word or a song uh, that you have. It can be by a smell, by a taste that you have, or even a sound that you hear. Uh, most of the time when our minds are elsewhere, something wafts through the air, uh, and reminds us and, and, and says, listen, you're not only an executive. You're not only a stay-at-home dad. You're not only a, a, a CEO uh, a lawyer lady, uh, you know, uh, whatever. You're also a sexual being. And when these things pass through by thought, image, word, song, smell, taste, sound, um, our minds may be elsewhere, but it taps us on the shoulder without warning, and it draws our attention to something innate and primal and, and asks us to entertain it. Now, this is now where we're making this progression. So here it is. So this engagement comes, uh, you're right here. Okay, okay, you got these here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you do those four? Yep. So thank you, guys. Just, just hear, hear my heart in this. So when this engagement comes, there's an awareness, a consciousness, a mindedness of our sexual nature. That happens, it awakens our desire, which is the interest, appetite, and longing. You know what? An orgasm would sound good now. An ejaculation would sound good now. A climax would sound good now. Uh, you know, your lady think, you know, double click in my own mouse might be nice right now. You know, I could do that right now. Or before I get out of bed, or maybe in the shower, or, uh, you know, maybe uh, right after I get home from work and before I work out, or maybe after a workout, or whatever this is, this pops in our mind, is awakens a desire. Desire stirs arousal. We feel a tingle, a tickle, a jingling, a rustling in our loins, a rustling in the physical part of us. And that arousal seeks stimulation, and stimulation now facilitates that release. So, so think of these things in concert. So here we go. Number three. There's only five points. I thank you for standing here with me. Number three. In a real world, uh, we humans are seldom afforded the opportunity to pause our lives to accommodate our sexual desire each time it becomes engaged. When this process happens and you're at the gym or you're 
uh, you know, driving down the street. Sometimes Connie will text me uh, and say, you know, uh, uh, I'm here to meeting, blah, 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 blah. And I was just thinking about you. And I was thinking about, you know, whatever position. I was thinking about, you know, uh, eating my peach. Or I was thinking about this happened. Or I was thinking about us last night. And what happens is there's been an engagement that has triggered a desire. And, and, and she'll say, she'll say the phrase. I think you'll say, you know, I felt that. Like, mm -hmm. like, like it, it, something down there, down there in, in the nether region, down there in the haystack, tingle. Something, a tingle, something mm -hmm. stirs there. But obviously in a, in a room full of moms at a PTA meeting or whatever, you know, she, she can't start, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, jilling your, jilling <laughs> off there. Uh, it reminds me of the time you were in uh, Vegas, uh, in the, um, sauna, the steam room or whatever. Yeah. Uh, she's in the steam room and you walk in the steam room, there's all these ladies, you know, guys, we've always wanted to walk in the steam room where all the ladies are. Uh, but, uh, she's in there with all these ladies. She said, I couldn't see who was in there. But they give you these these wristband key things that you have for your locker, and she says the whole time I'm in there, I think you said you couldn't it's all steamy. you, you couldn't see, see the lady, but she was an outline, and you just hear this key just chinga 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 chinga, and she was like, oh my gosh, Mike, I think she was going to town in there. So some people they can stimulate where, wherever they are, um, but that's not always possible. Um, in nearly all instances, when this engagement hits us, we're able to maintain function. Why? We redirect our attention and our budding arousal to present demands. Connie can have this idea, but she's at a PTA meeting. I may be walking from the mailbox uh, uh, place to pick up the mail, to drop off packages, mail out books, and something hits me, and I can feel a stirring in my loins. But I don't sit there and jerk off in the parking lot. What it does is I pause. Thank God. Yeah, that's a, I'm pretty sure it's a felony. Uh, I pause to say, uh, you know what? I'm going to save this release for an opportune time. And it actually builds a desire momentum. It like the, the, the engagement comes, the desire comes, the arousal comes, we let it rest. An engagement comes, the desire comes. Connie will send a thing. She'll say, hey, are you by yourself? I was like, yeah. She said, get ready to get in the shower. Uh, can you take a pick? And I take a pick. And what is it? It's engagement. It's desire. It's arousal. And that builds so that by the time we do get home, and sometimes we get home and we're just too tired to do anything. Other times we get home and we just can't wait to put the whole house to bed so that we can get to what... Uh, we've been working on. Um, so, so, or other times we just shake it off. I can't think about that now. I got stuff going on. I'm driving down the street or the kids are yelling in the back of the car or whatever it is. Um, only rarely can we pause our, our non-sexual lives to indulge release. Now, I remember being a young man, 13-ish, 14 years old, when I discovered masturbation. Uh, I discovered it quite by accident. As a matter of fact, in our new book, The Virgin and the Trollop, coming out, uh, it was supposed to be out in May, but then Corona happened, so it'll probably be out later in the summer or, I guess, in the fall. Um... In our new book, I talk about the first time I stumbled into what masturbation was. I had no idea. You hear about jerking off. You hear about beating off. You hear about these things as a young man, and you don't know what people are talking about. Nobody has any idea what that really means. Uh, but I remember the first time I stumbled into it, I, I was scared at first, and then I thought, oh, my God, i got to do that again. I've got – that has got to happen uh, again. What is this? Um, but then as I realized I could do it on demand and on command as a 14-year-old, uh, then it was like, well, I only do it at home. But I remember being overcome – in class, I'd be in ninth grade in class, and just uh, I remember looking over at a girl. She had a, sh a sleeveless shirt on, and you could just see the side of her breast and her bra. And that image triggered an engagement, triggered a desire, triggered an arousal. And and I remember thinking, I've got to I've got to do this again. And there was more than one time. I'm not proud to admit that I left or went to a bathroom between class and back at 14 in 60 seconds. You could, you could, wow. you could climax in it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so that was, you know, and I may be the only one, but I'm telling you, it's the only, it's the, it's uh, you know, it's the only sport I lettered in. It was, was it was the only sport I lettered in in high school. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's like you uh, graduated. Connie, come loudly. All right. So anyway, um, uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I love you too. Um, you gotta hurry up. I know, I know. Okay, what's okay. no? I'm just okay, saying okay, for okay. tonight. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're not, we're not gonna be too much longer. Okay, so. Um, but in the adult world, it's not often practical to do that. Um, and in a partner world especially, and we're, we're talking about porn, but I'm, I'm laying a foundation for why porn uh, and, and what's the, the case for Christ concerning it and how to approach it. We usually find our partner is, non, is not engaged sexually at the precise moment we've been tapped on the shoulder. That's a big thing. So I can be upstairs working and I get engaged out of nowhere, it taps me on the shoulder, desire comes, I, uh, I, I feel arousal, and I think, oh, stimulation is good, and I come bebopping down to Connie to see what's going on, right while she's got two calls on hold, Mikey doing a test, and five minutes to get something set up before, because she's got to uh, uh, speak to another pastor or whatever, and I come down, and I'm partially erect, and I'm like, hey, you got five minutes? She's like, what can I help you with? 
Uh, uh, do you need something? And that right there, I mean, my, my, everything goes down and you realize it's just not practical. Just because it has tapped me on the shoulder doesn't necessarily tap, means tapped her on the shoulder. And the opposite is true. She'll be out on a walk. I'll be right in the middle of a chapter, right in the middle of the thing, talking about how God showed up and working on this thing and this, this proposal and this and this and this. And she'll just come up and plop on the chair. She'll be like, hey, I'm like, hey, what? So nothing, I was just seeing what you're doing. Do you need something? No, I don't really need something. And what she's saying is, I'm feeling a rustling, but what's tapped me on the shoulder hasn't tapped you on the shoulder. So in the adult world, especially in a partner world, sometimes what happens is it'll tap one or both of you on the shoulder. And by the time you get the place still enough to facilitate it, it's left you. So it's like, yeah, give it two minutes. Yeah, give it five minutes. I should be home in a little bit. But by the time you do this and get the dog and get this and get that, by the time you get up there, now you're doing it. What's happened? The desire and arousal has begun to fade. So now more stimulation is needed. And it's not only in a masturbatory context, it's even in a partnered sex context. If you, and this is why we believe in variety and married sex, that, you know, missionary intercourse is awesome. It's beautiful. It's probably the best thing that there is. But if you're going to have sex every day, there is an element of novelty that contributes to uh, 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 arousal. And in a married sex life, and as a christ honoring person, you can't get novelty by going outside of your spouse. I can't get novelty to say, well, Connie's got uh, 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 her, her B cups, her uh, B cup beauties, but I want to see some D cups today because seeing novelty will arouse me. Well, you can't go to novelty. So when I can't go to novelty or I can't say, well, let me see somebody uh, Latina or let me see somebody uh, black or let me see somebody, uh, uh, you know, European and German accent or let me see somebody Asian or let me see. And why? Because in novelty, that will stir my arousal because my natural desire cycle is off. Let me go outside of my covenant with my wife or as a single person, let me peer upon a body that is not mine or peer upon a woman that God has not given me as a wife when I, when, I want, when I want novelty, porn provides that. But in absence of novelty, which you cannot do as a couple to find novelty, well, let's see what a younger woman, an older woman, a taller woman, a slender woman, a thicker woman, you can't do that as a married couple. So what do we do? We put variety in. Variety now with creativity. So, so we'll do manual someday. We'll do oral someday. We'll do it in this position or that position. We say, you know what we haven't done in a while? You know what sounds fun? You know what we ought to do? We ought to take a bath. You know what sounds good? We ought to do this. We ought to do that. Why? Because since I can't get novelty to go with other people to go outside of the garden, I get variety. Why? Because where there's variety, it can keep the arousal and desire higher. Because sometimes if you do the same thing over and over again, even masturbating or even uh, missionary or even certain positions. You're like, oh, well, I like rear entry positions or what they call doggy style or side positions or uh, oral sex or blowjobs or whatever this kind of thing is. If it's the same thing all the time, it'd be like having the same meal all the time. It'd be like we just have meatloaf every single night, every single night. But when you have meatloaf on one Tuesday and tacos on one Tuesday and, and you go out to Zaxby's on one Tuesday, variety now takes the place of novelty. But porn promises unending novelty. Porn says when you can't stimulate yourself enough to get release because your desire is low, because your arousal is low, I'll throw novelty and all these other things at you. Okay, we're going on. We're yeah. doing good. Okay, here we go. Um, moving forward. Now, so... Uh, number four. We only got five points. Here comes number four. Um, so um, now I want to shift gears to where porn is. God intended our entire process of sexual engagement, remembering that we're sexual beings, all the way to sexual release. He wanted that to occur in the context of dynamic connection. I think that's coming to you. God wanted that to occur in the context of dynamic connection. What I mean by dynamic, I mean layered. And I don't mean layered, I mean dichotomous. What is dichotomous? Uh, being two parts, outer and inner. See, I'm dichotomous. I'm an inner person and outer person. Or, 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 I, or I'm tangible and intangible, substantive and, and uh, 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 spiritual. But not only is it inner and outer, it's trichotomous. What do I mean? That God wanted the dynamic connection to be spirit, soul, and body. Now, this is a big deal because it, in, in sexual release, God does not want us to have a sexual release apart from dynamic connection, a layered dynamic, dichotomous, the inner and outer man, trichotomous, the spirit, soul, and body, all of these engaged is how, in a dynamic connection, that's God's plan for release. And this is the secret to uh, uh, ongoing fulfillment versus emptiness. And that's what sometimes porn does, is it leaves us empty because it's not a dynamic connection. It does not occur in a dynamic connection. Uh, this is the difference between appreciating and diminishing returns. One of the problems with porn is, and again, I'm not speaking in this in a shaming context, but porn does not return. Uh, I've taught this before about, about Vegas, and if any of you are gamblers or you know, anything like that, let me tell you how casinos work. Casinos pay you X amount back on every dollar that you bet. 
So it's very creative, very complex process. But basically they say, you know, like these machines pay out, let's say uh, 90 cents on the dollar. So you put a dollar in, you're supposed to get 90 cents back. Now it's not literally how it works, but that's basically how it works. So if you put, if you put $100 in a machine or 100 pennies in a penny machine or whatever it is, if you put $100 in a machine, by the time you bet that whole $100 through, you should have about 90-ish bucks back. But they count on you not paying attention to how much you bet. So what they want you to do is to bet through your 100 and you wound up with 90. Then they want you to bet that 90 and wind up with about 78. Then they want you to bet that 78 and wind up with about 66. Then they want you to bet that 66 and wind up with about 52. Then it, and, and next thing you know, you said, man, where'd all my money go? You, 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 you were getting a little less back each time you engaged, a little less back each time you um, uh, 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 put, in, put, you know, put out something. That's what porn does. The, the, as you engage with porn, uh, and take this from me, I was exposed to porn when I was six years old. And it has affected my life even to this day. I'm 46 years old. Think of that. That's 40 years that seed was dropped in me. I remember the fascination of seeing uh, a woman's uh, 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 body. I remember the fascination of seeing her pubic hair. I remember the fascination of seeing uh, the way uh, the model's le legs would be butterfly. And I'm talking about six years old. I remember knowing the difference at about seven years old between a Playboy magazine who rarely showed pubic hair to a penthouse magazine that showed pubic hair to hardcore magazines like Hustler where you could actually see the labia. I mean, what seven-year-old needs that type of knowledge thrust on them? Uh, even before my body could comprehend what arousal was, very graphic things by babysitters, predators, etc. I was introduced to. Um, so that has been part of my life even to this day and I'm hypersensitive to it and I notice that it can call to me. And this is not that I'm not saved. This is not that I'm not born again. This is not that I don't have the Holy Spirit inside me. It's that I've been exposed to certain things. Some of you are awakened sexually, not out of your own divine process of maturity. You were awakened sexually by molestation. You were awakened sexually by abuse. You were awakened sexually by rape. And sometimes those type of things happen to us and we go completely asexual uh, where we shut all that part of our lives down or we go completely prosexual where uh, uh, we get very aggressive and very open and we try to regain power and we try to uh, 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 do it on our terms and our, our authority or we bypass and begin to, because our bodies were bypassed, that pleasure was sought apart from our personhood, that our personhood was torn from our sex and our sex existed uh, independent of who we are. We now experience sex not in a dynamic context or a, a dynamic uh, connection. We experience it purely in a physical. So you may masturbate or you may please yourself or you may be with partners or you may be watching porn because the sexual you has been separated dynamically from the triune you, from the dichotomous inner and outer you. So um, so now you get uh, diminishing returns. You watch porn and 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 just a little, you know, it starts out as a as a as a as a J.C. Penny lingerie section, you know, turns you on, or then you go to a a uh, uh, and then it's the, it's the Sears catalog turns you on, then it's Victoria's Secret turns you on, then it's Fredericks of Hollywood turns you on, then it's Playboy turns you on, then it's an HBO rated R movie or a, or a, or what we would have Revenge of the Nerds or things like this or or a, mm -hmm. a, a, a Porkies. Porkies and and things like that and and, and, and this turns you on. But, but, but it takes your dollar, but only gives you back 90 cents. And so to get more, now you got to go to something a little harder, you got to go to something a little harder. So now you become interested in women having sex with each other. You become interested now, and the idea of a lesbian, uh, 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 you know, a lesbian connection, even if they're not real lesbians, but just pretending they're lesbians, you get conditioned by porn to fake orgasmic responses from women. That the, ah, ah, in the moaning, oh yeah, oh yeah, and harder, harder, all that kind of stuff. You, you get conditioned to that, that that you're not in the room, you're not the guy with the, the penis down to his knees, you're not uh, uh, you know the, the guy that's having sex, but your mind inserts and itself in the situation and you want to feel like that's what you're giving to a female. And many females watch this and say, oh, that's how to respond in a sexual situation. So they start to mimic, so porn starts to write the script for real life sex whether it be solo sex or partnered sex, but it never gives us a full dollar back. And so we need a little bit more. And so maybe we want some group sex or maybe we want something with pain. It's not enough to watch a blow job. Maybe we want to see someone tortured or choked or uh, someone pain or, or sometimes we feel like we can mix a pain response and a dominance response with a sexual arousal response. What are we trying to do? We're trying, like, like most things in this fallen world, we're trying to get back a full return on our investment, but the, the, the uh, returns are depreciating. But in a dynamic connection, 
where there's a refilling spirit, soul, and body, where there's an outer and inner connection that you as a single person uh, are spirit, soul, and body, outer and inner person connecting with your sexual part and uh, identity in the presence of God or your sexual capacity in the presence of God, or as a partner person where it's not just God and I connecting as a single, uh, but Connie and I connecting as a married couple, that we connect conversationally, communication-wise, and everything else. Let me give you this in your notes. Let's talk about uh, simple connection for singles. We're working our way. We're on point four. We only got to get to point five. I thank you for staying on. Um, so uh, what does sexual connection for singles look like? What does a dynamic connection look like? Uh, Connie will be sending it to you here. It's got like one, two, three, four little points. Um, it, as a single person, you have to have a recognition or, and a reverence uh, of your divinely implanted desire. You say, you know what? This desire for sexual release is in me. It may have been awakened by demonic means. It may have been awakened by natural means. You may have just been a young lady who all your life had thought, I wonder what it'd be like to be kissed. Or when you found out what a penis was, you thought, I wonder what it'd be like to touch that. Or when, when you heard a woman having sex or saw on the television, you thought, man, what must it be like to have what's happening to her happening to me? You have to have a recognition of that, that that's divinely implanted. Maybe not the way, the fallen way it was awakened, but what it connected to inside you came from God and a reverence that what you have there is not your own. It came from God. What do I mean by that? So God did two things. In Genesis 3, it, uh, Genesis 2, it says he made trees that looked good to the eyes. He made trees that had fruit that tasted good to the lips. So he made the, well, first of all, he did is he made a human that had eyes to appreciate uh, allure and beauty. He made a human that had taste buds to appreciate taste. He, he implanted the desire and then made the tree that would satisfy that desire. And that's in all capacity. So he's put this divinely implanted desire for sexual release in us and then has created the means by which that could take place. And for a single person, uh, this would be in a masturbatory context. So by a recognition and reverence that this desire in you for this climax, uh, it, it comes from God. This desire in you for sex and for sexual connection comes from God. Number two, or, or I guess the second point, um, you have to approach this as a single with an honor-based stewardship. What I mean by honor-based stewardship? That I'm going to honor God with my body, but I'm also going to honor others. That I'm not going to take from others what doesn't belong to me, and I have in my notes here, and their others. Not only am I honoring, so as a, as a, as a single man, as a married man, I've got to honor other women that that's not my body to look on, that, that those breasts are not mine to look at, those breasts are not mine to ogle, they belong to her husband. And she doesn't have a husband. They belong to God and, and, and they are hers to honor God with. I have no business seeing them. But not only will I be dishonoring her by looking on what I should not look on, I'll be dishonoring her other. So not only do I have to have a stewardship of my own sexuality, but others and their others. The Bible says that when I sleep with a woman who I'm not married to, uh, I'm stealing from her, from her future husband. I'm stealing from God who... I have not made a commitment to, to behold that. She's not made a commitment to me to be pleasured by my penis. And, and I now have secrets of women that I may have slept with before I was married. I know things about them that their husbands don't know. I've accessed things that God intended only for their husbands. Or you may have slept with men. You've accessed things God only intended for their wives. So not only did I not honor God for myself and honor God for others, I dishonored the others' others. And so if you're going to have a simple connection in a dynamic expression of your sexuality, you have to do that. And then you have to have self-awareness and honesty about your desire. Look, I have these desires, Father, and I'm honest about it. I'm not saying, I don't like that. I don't want that. I'm not interested in that. That doesn't mean anything to me. He knows an orgasm feels good. And if you're watching this, you've never masturbated. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you start. I'm just talking about for those that are already have these things going on. Uh, and Connie, what's interesting about it is I was a virgin when we got married and I masturbated all the time. Even as a Christian, I struggled with, nobody ever told me that how to, how to do these things, how to recognize that my desire came from God and to reverence it, how to honor God and other people and their others. Nobody ever told me to be honest about what was going on with me and to do it in God's light. Nobody ever told me that. But I was sexually obsessed as a virgin. Connie was an anti-virgin, as she would say. Uh, uh, this is what our new book is on. It's Our book is The Virgin and the Trollop. That's this, it's the story of how these very confused, broken people came together. She had had sex, lots of sex with multiple partners and never had any sexual desire. And I remember when we got together, I was like, well, since you've been saved, have you ever masturbated? Have you ever done this? She said, no way. I said, well, you ever get like horny at night and da-da-da? No way. Would you ever think of any of your past boyfriends and think, oh, when I was with Tom, it was really great. She said, are you kidding me? No way. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I've not been with anybody. 
And, and, I, and I have all these thoughts and imaginations from my past all the time. And she's like, I've been with everybody and, and never think of how cool or awesome that would be. Yeah, so here's, sure. these, here's, the, um, here's the virgin who's sexually consumed, not knowing how to honor God sexually. And here's the non-virgin who's completely sexually detached, who through trauma, her sex had been torn off of her and the sexual part of her existed over here and the spirit, the, the spirit and soul part of her over here and they never met. So, so this is how our joint brokenness came together. Okay, moving on. And of course, if you want to jump in here. Okay, all right, okay. I know we're, okay. Um, you got a lot to get out. I know, I, well, I'm on number four, here we go. <laughs> yep. um, and then it has to be focused. You have to take this sexual desire and focus it into Christ honoring action that can be done in God's presence. So you're honest about your sexual desires. You do that in God's light. Um, uh, you're honest uh, in, in God's presence. You do that in God's light, but you're, you're, you act on it in God's presence. So I'm honest in God's light, but my action takes place in God's presence. Is it possible to masturbate as a Christian and honor God? Well, you have to be honest about are you fueling it by things that dishonor God? Are you reaching to others, to others, others through porn or in the real world? Can you do it in the presence of God and say, God, this is inside me. I, 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 I have these desires. I, I wake up with these feelings. I have these dreams. Father, I'm trying to channel it and honor you. I'm being honest in the light. And can you think about generically being the joys of being with, uh, if you're a woman, you said the joys of being with a man, being held by a man, making love to a man, uh, being penetrated by a man, pleasing a man. Can you think of that generically, which God wired you as a woman? He, he made you to have those appetites and then created the trees and the fruit that fulfill those appetites. Can you do that in the context of God's light and God's presence? Can I, as a single unmarried man, not think about, oh, I like Jan because she's got big breasts, or, oh, I like, you know, uh, Tammy because she's got a big butt, or, oh, man, I would like to, you know, I don't know, uh, suck on those toes or whatever it is. That's stealing from others. But can I, as a male sexual creation, think about God to, to be with a woman? Can I, can I masturbate in God's presence with the thought of being with a woman? Somebody said, well, it's selfish, it's selfish, it's selfish. Yeah, but you've got to realize that the sin of masturbation, you know, he says, every man have their own husband and own wife instead of taking from others. That's the battle. The battle is to be honest with yourself before God and say, God, these are my struggles. This is where I'm at. And I'm trying to honor you in this. And I know I can't go to others. I know I can't peer to others. I know I can't partake of others. So God, help me in your light and in your presence uh, uh, channel this and honor you with it. And I think if you'll cut off all the outside feeding sources, you may find your desire and arousal reattains a natural rhythm, and then you may find that the action on that rhythm and the release associated with it can happen in a context that you're not uh, looking outside to violate uh, God's, God's will. Okay, here we go. Complex connection for couples. A complex connection for couples um, has to be equal and equitable. Uh, it can't be on negotiation that she's given it because she wants this or he's taking it because she wants that. It's got to be mutual. It's got to be a transparent exchange. When I say to a woman, when I say, what I'm doing for my wife, I I'm making a transparent exchange of a common currency. She doesn't have to give it to me. She doesn't have to give up sex. I don't have to give up my, my sex. She doesn't, she says, I really want this from him and I want to access this. And, and guys, your penis is as valuable as her vagina. And, and I'm so grateful that there's not a bunch of women out there going, oh yeah, you know, I've, I've had, you know, the, the, what is it? The hickey from Kanicki or whatever that guy was. <laughs> I've had the hickey from the Mickey or whatever it is. I'm so glad. Listen, Connie qualified to access my sex. She qualified by making a commitment to me, by taking my name, by making me exclusive, by connecting with me conversationally, relationally, partnering with me, putting me first, putting me only, uh, being with me in victory times and setback times, setting aside, being exclusive and uh, as, a, as a servant and as a co-laborer and as a loving person and allows me to serve her and co-labor. That's what qualifies us to access each other's body. So unlike a single person who exists in a simple connection between them and God, we have a complex connection. Uh, we have a layered complex dynamic connection because we're, we're, we're interacting through intimacy through honesty, transparency, vulnerability. We share our inner lives. We share our outer lives. We share our financial lives, our dreams, our visions, our spiritual pursuit. We're on a common adventure with God. And sharing on all those points allows us to connect physically and share physically. So here's the thing. When we're not connecting and sharing and partnering and loving and walking in this life together as a couple, then guess what? Desire and arousal will be low. 
So now porn becomes a tempting thing to go outside to watch something lustfully. Why? Because we don't have the connection that would sustain. We're not in, in, in variety and novelty because it's not novelty that I get different boobs or novelty that she gets a different penis. Well, I'd like an uncircumcised one this week and I'd like a girthy one this week and I'd like a longer one this week and I'd like a, you know, that, that's not how it works. But because we can't get novelty in other people, we do get novelty in continually discovering each other. So as she's walking with God and I'm walking with God and she's becoming a new person and I'm becoming a new person and she's sharing her inner and outer life with me and I'm sharing my inner and outer life with her and we're experiencing new movies together and new hikes together and new ice creams together and new games together and new fun together and new hobbies and baths and, and new swimming holes together and all these kind of things. We're, we're, we're doing all these things and we, new, new uh, uh, dinner and restaurants. Mm, taste this, taste this. As we're discovering new novelties in all spheres of our life, that sustains the physical desire. And the more emotionally, spiritually, inner and outer, conversationally, recreationally, uh, partner-wise, ups, downs, season of victory, seasons of setback, the more we bond that way, we don't get novelty of physical bodies. We don't need to introduce novelty of external people or violate, but our continual novelty in the sharing of our lives together, that stirs us sexually, which is why she's talking what she said. She says, I want to, you know, she's like, let's finish this thing up. And we've talked about all day when, yeah. you know, we're going to go make love together we today. Plan. We got a plan. <laughs> but here's the thing about it. Someone said, what do you mean you got a plan? That's inappropriate. It's the ultimate expression of what God would want. We share each other in every way. And the fact that after 19 years and all the sex that we've had, that we still desire one another, that we, you know, we've had a whole bunch of uh, ice cream and, and uh, ho-hos and Twinkies and, and all that kind of stuff. We both put on weight but she still does it for me, and, and, and I think I still oh, do yeah. it for you. Oh, man, yeah. Uh, so, so, so uh, 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 but it's, it's our complex connection that she's not just a P-U-S-S-Y to me. She's not just tits to me. She's not just a bouncing body. She's complex. She's layered. I'm connected with her in every way, shape, and form, and that keeps me coming back to the same old and the same old, and the, the Tits are the same, and the butt is the same, and the penis is the same, and the head is the same, and the it's, it's all the same. Great. Yeah, and so don't you get bored with it? No, because we're connecting in complex, total sphere layers. God is doing something in us. God is doing something in her. He's doing something in me. That sharing of that, we're on an adventure together, that all reinventing, recycling all the time makes the same old penis and the same old vag Glorious, awesome. yeah. And there's only too many, so many ways you can do it. You can pull it, pull it, pull it, push it, bop it, yank it, <laughs> click it, lick it, flick it, slap it. You can watch each other. You can film uh, porn for each other. You can, uh, uh, you can, there's only so much you can do. We're inside the garden. But because we are eternal, we connect spirit, soul, and body. Adventure. Da, da, da. But as a single person, you, you say, I don't have that. But you're in God. And you and God are in this part. You're, you're Adam before Eve came. And your fullness is in God. And guess what? Even though Eve hasn't or Adam hasn't come into your life, your man, woman, whatever, you're still a sexual being because God created you that way and you can honor God with those desires in the presence of God. All right, now, here's the thing. Porn, we're coming to a close. Porn gives a simulated connection. It's not dynamic. It's not simple. It's not complex. It's simulated because it's void of the basic elements. Porn is not real. It, t it's, it tells us we can be who we are not where we are not, doing what we're not really doing uh, with equipment we don't really possess and doing it with a person we don't even know. And the problem with porn is it's time free. It's season free. It's age free. No matter who I am at 46, I can, in my mind, be with a 22-year-old or an 18-year-old or a 50-year-old. I can be whatever I want. And, and if, if I'm aging, porn allows me to be with somebody who is back where I, I was or back where I think I should be. And that's not real. The biggest issue with porn, please make sure okay. this one gets put yeah, up. Okay. Have you done it? This yeah, is important. Is it's pleasure apart from personhood. That's the problem. Is that I, it's, it's, it's exploited because it's pleasure apart from personhood. That Here's the thing. With Connie attached to that vagina, attached to that booty, attached to that, those breasts, is a human being. But when I go through porn, I get to see a vagina and there's no person attached to it. I am looking at it and, and touching myself or lusting not after a human being that has fears and ups and downs and faith and visions and dreams and a family and is cared about and is God's daughter and is God's creation. I'm not connecting to any of that. I'm only 
connecting to the pleasure associated with this apart from personhood. And that same predatory behavior doesn't have to be through porn. It can also be in human relationships that I will tell a woman or tell a man whatever I have to tell him, lies how I feel, if I'm available, interested, whatever I got to do to access their sex apart from their personhood. And porn does that. We don't honor them. We don't give them the people in porn equal standing or value. It just gives us an opportunity to use them inappropriately. And I don't care that they don't mind being used. Oh, they don't care. They took their clothes off. They did a gang sex session and they don't really care. Or they're pretending to be a raped simulation. They don't really care. They're offering it to me willingly. But just because someone broken offers it to you willingly, and I'm not even saying they're broken. If you're a sex worker, I'm not even shaming you for being broken. But I'm saying just because you're willing to offer it to me willingly, for my Christ-honoring soul, I'm supposed to turn my self away from it. Yeah, but if you will take what they're offering, it'll stir your desire and it'll partner with your stimulation and it'll lead you to release. But I'd rather let my desire find its natural flow so that the stimulation works naturally than in pursuit of the ejaculation, in pursuit of the cum, in pursuit of the orgasm to try to inject things that God hasn't made available to me to, to assist me in that. And that's where it comes to poor, pressure upon person. Uh, number, uh, the next one is access without accountability. Uh, there's old, uh, uh, in porn it allows me to, to take without giving. Uh, the porn actresses don't demand cooperation. They don't demand life fruitfulness. They don't demand a sense of community or standard of conduct. The porn ladies don't care if I take the trash out or not. Or don't, I don't have to be kind to them. I can't call Connie stupid, fat, ugly. Even though I call her fat all the time. That's funny. She's like, I'm so fat. Oh, yeah, you're so fat. Uh, um, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't care if I'm a good father or not. They don't care if I took the trash out. They don't care if I sat there and watched television while uh, they cooked, they did this and they did that. Why? Because I get access to their sex without the accountability of relationship. Yeah, well, I give money, you know, I pay money for it. That's an exchange of goods and services. Yeah, but sex is supposed to be with an exchange of the self. I don't give Connie goods and services, say, I bring money into this house, turn over and pull those pants down. That's predatory. Connie, you're an equal human being. I don't care if I make $10 million a year and she does nothing but stay home with the kids. Or if she makes $20 million a year and I do nothing but stay home with the kids. Let me tell you something. We are equals in this. And it's not, I bring money in so you give me this. That's ridiculous. I exchange and share my life with you. And in exchange for sharing my life, my destiny, my future, my faith, my spirit, my soul and body. In exchange for sharing that with you, we trade sexual interaction with one another. Sexual fulfillment. Uh, prostitutes and cam girls. Um, you, they will talk to you, have conversations with you. Uh, it doesn't matter how you treat them. You know, the, ain't nobody getting sex. Everybody's getting screwed. They're saying what they got to say to get money. They're saying what they got to say to keep you engaged. But that your relationship would not be the same if you took the money out of the equation. That's what makes porn deceptive. And finally, porn is an overreach. It's a theft. It takes what is not our portion based on curiosity and novelty. You can get that mm -hmm. in there based on curiosity and novelty, that I get to take by porn what is not mine. I'm curious, what would it be like to be, and I've only been with this one woman, what would it be like to be with an Asian woman? What would it be like to be with a younger woman? Connie and I got married at 27. I wonder what the, would it be like to be one of those 18-year-old girls in my high school or college? What would it be like to be with a black woman? What would it be like to be with two women at the same time? This is my curiosity, which is based in lust. It's an overreach, which is what? God has given me abundance. All the sex I want. There's nothing that any woman can give me that Connie doesn't give me. Oh, well, I don't know how to ride it. And I bet if you never had this for me and this for that. Listen, at the end of the day, it's arousal, stimulation, and climax. It, uh, uh, it, it, the, the fact that you say, well, I can give you this, yeah, but I would get it from you apart from your personhood. I would get it from you taking from you, dishonoring God, and getting it from other people. The fact that Connie and I have to work to communicate that I don't have a clitoris and I don't have a vagina and she doesn't have a penis and, 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 and we have to learn those things together and work on those things together and give of ourselves to, to discover and to serve and to keep building and to bring creativity. That's what makes it wholesome is that it's, it's a giving and a taking. Um, uh, and porn offers unending novelty to the point where you can fetishize. I want only big boobs. I want only big penises. I want only black guys, only black women, uh, only uh, Latina. I want only this. I want only group sex. I want only lesbian. It's like people become products. There's no way that can be in harmony with the with the Christ-honoring mind. And Jesus, the people are products. We've been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus and commanded to glorify God in our body and spirits, which are God. Our inner and outer man should glorify the Father. And we can't do that by imbibing with what God would not have us imbibe. 
we lead to comparison. So we're either going to belittle what somebody else has or be prideful. Connie doesn't have this. Maybe my penis isn't that. Maybe her breasts aren't this. I'm going to belittle it or I'm going to be prideful. Look what I got that these other people don't have. And I'll end up with a continual fascination uh, 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 versus uh, I'll be a little or be prideful instead of having continual fascination. The reason you want to move on to another vagina or another penis is you've not yet appreciated as a couple the beauty of the one God has given you in your marriage. There's one penis in, my, in her whole life, one vagina in my whole life. We have one. And to appreciate the value and the beauty of it season by season. I know what it's like to be with her 27-year-old body. I don't know what it's like to be with her, with her 47-year-old body. I'm going to find out in a couple months here. But it's not that, oh, you don't have your 27-year-old body or your 16-year-old body. We're moving on. That's not how it works. That, that, that God says there's something to discover in her stretch marks. There's something to discover as her body ages. There's something to discover as her skin changes. There's something to discover as her hormones evolve. God's like, I'm on an adventure with you sexually, and you've experienced this season, that season, this season. But porn says you don't have to accept seasons and stay on God's track. You can just time travel and be anywhere you want. That cannot be the will of the Father. Okay, and porn is one-dimensional. Uh, what do I mean by that? Sex has temperature taste, texture, hormones, pheromones, there's smells, there's feelings. Porn gives you none of that. Porn gives you a two-dimensional image and the impossible pressure of your hand. When you're having sex, squeeze my breast harder, play with my nipples uh, right there on the head, faster, slower, cup my, you know, play with my balls or whatever might be said during sex or things like that. Or if you're solo, you're, you're masturbating, you know exactly how fast to go. Are you circling clockwise, counterclockwise, upper left to lower right on your clitoris? Are you, are you uh, going overhand or overhand, overhand or underhand on your penis, just around the head, all the way to the base, fast, slow, whatever you're doing? You know that, that's, that, that, that can never be the grip, the pressure, the sensation, the pace, the timing. It can never be replicated because you are tracking real time with your pleasure. That's why it's guaranteed to hit. But in a sexual relationship where you give to one another, where you honor God and you don't bring outsiders in, as a single person, it's just you and God. As a married couple, it's you, God, and your spouse. That takes mm -hmm. a complex. That's, that's layers that I'm feeling and sensing, the sweat and, and the taste and the touch. But, but uh, and, and, and I would prefer you as a single person to go in your own mind in the presence of God rather than stealing images, bringing them internally. And now it's not you and God alone in the garden. It's you and God and who you've stolen from along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Porn okay, is not authentic. Good. Number five. Here we go. Close, close, close. Doing it. Good. Yeah. Here we go. Um, sex cannot be done. You've never seen sex on screen uh, that was legitimate because no one can have sex with others in mind. Um, when you're actually having real sex, you can only be thinking about yourself and your partner. And anytime somebody sets up a camera and says, we're going to have sex, and whatever they're doing is for others to see, it is not sex. If they make a sound or adjust an angle, or maybe they cover a sound. See, in, in, you know, we often see women act out in movies, even non-pornographic movies, ah, ah, and all these loud things. Sometimes orgasms don't happen that way. Sometimes there's a whimper, not a scream. And a lot of times men... When they have sex in the movies and even in porn and things like that, they're very reserved. Let me tell you what, when you can let down your ego and make love to a woman that you even, I'm talking about even in a non in a married context, if you say, I had sex with lots of women. If you've never been safe with a woman to let your guard totally down, to let this, this to give yourself over fully to the pleasure, to let the beast and the child come out. What is the beast? That thing that comes over you when you fully give yourself to your orgasm and you feel that rumble and that, um, that, that, that thing that overtakes you uh, um, and, and uh, your breathing changes and your, your breath changes and your body shudders. You have to be safe enough around a woman, free enough from ego to even l let that pleasure come fully there. What will she think afterwards if I, if I give myself totally to her pleasure? I don't want her to think she has power over me. I don't want her to think she's weak. I don't want her to think that, that she's given me better than I'm giving her. That's all ego. That's all of the flesh. That's all of the world. When you completely give yourself over to it and that thing comes out of you, part horse, part gorilla, uh, a part, part wolf from Tom and Jerry, you know, I mean, all this kind of stuff. And you, I mean, you can't, and it, I mean, you're like you've been plugged into a socket and your body convulses when you give yourself over to that. And then immediately after that, electrocution is death. And now as a child, you become this, you go from being this strong, uh, 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 pulsating being to immediately collapse and to be that vulnerable in the arms and in the bosom of a woman. That is pleasure, but that's not portrayed on screen because 
porn and screen has got to be, somebody's got to be dominating. It can't be equal. She's got to be dominating, belittling, humiliating, punishing him, or he's got to be dominating, humiliating, or really giving it to her. She's taking it, or it hurts, or she's choking, or he's choking her, or whatever. That, and we, we take that as scripts. Many of our young people, some of you watching this, porn has trained you for what sex is. And you get in sex, and, and the first thing you do is, okay, well, he's got to pull it out so he can shoot it on my chest or shoot it on my face. Where'd you learn that from? Well, I learned it on, 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 on a movie. Or I've got to say this, or he's got to choke me, or he's got to slap me, or I've got to uh, do this. To Where'd you learn that? Porn has given me the script. You're not alone for discovery in a garden. You're taking from a fallen world and, and taking a script that violates the sanctity of divine creation and divine will, sexual Eden, and you're saying, let's act according to that script. you got to peel that away, starve that out, and really just restart in missionary sex, just, just plain missionary sex, and say, I can't orgasm that way. Then just do it and, and do it till you can't do it anymore and come back the next night and come back the next night. I guarantee you three or four nights of that, you will climax. Stay there. Stay there till you can go a month just doing that. Then maybe switch to a different position. Maybe put the legs up. Maybe put the legs over. Maybe try it from behind. Stay there until you can climax that way. Don't feed from the outside. Then what do you do? Well, then we might switch to oral sex and we try that. I don't know. I can't do that. I got to be thinking of this. I got to be thinking of her. Keep your mind right where you need to be, not on the scene, not on a past girlfriend or boyfriend. Stay right where it needs to be. Why? Until you reach train your soul and body to connect in a dynamic relationship, but no longer thinking of others because there's no true sex that exists in Christ's economy that has others in mind. Um, everything else is acting. Uh, and even if you saw someone having sex on tape that didn't know they were have, being taped, that voyeurism itself is, is not true sex because it's, it's a, a void of personhood. Number five, porn during quarantine. Here's what happens. Your work is a gift from God. The work that you have, your job, whatever, these are gifts from God. Um, to, in, to labor and to enjoy the fruit of the labor, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, is a gift from God. There's all these lists, kind of now we're talking about it today. Do you know in the average life you spend 3.6 years waiting in line at a red light? Do you know in the average life you spend 2.2 years brushing your teeth? Do you know in the average life you spend, you know, 5.7 years in the shower? Do you know in the average life you spend 8.8 years going to lunch or packing a lunch? In quarantine, all that's been taken away from us. Even those of us are still working, the dressing, the prepping, the commute, the travel, the in-between meetings, the idle talk at lunch, the idle talk at the water cooler, the, the pointless check-ins, all that's been taken away. So now we have all this free time. And these little time gaps now have led to a place of potential engagement. We have more time than ever and a lot more time to engage ourselves sexually. But our freedom to engage ourselves sexually is now undermining the natural flow of our desire. So when we become mindful of our sexual nature, but we lack the unagitated desire, where can I turn? Because I want an orgasm. And you know what? I'm not doing anything for the next four hours. I'm here by myself. I'd like to come. Coming feels good. Having an orgasm feels good. But I had one late last night and yesterday morning. Hmm. I want the end result, but I'm out of rhythm with my natural desire and arousal. Ah, let me click on the computer. Why? Let me see what I want to watch. Watch 10 seconds of this, 15 seconds of that. She didn't look right. She, he didn't look right. That's not what I meant. Oh, he's cute. Da, da, da. And now you start selecting what? Give me something synthetic to churn my desire, bring up my arousal so that my stimulation will connect me to the orgasm. Oh my God, I had an orgasm. So now what do we do? That felt great. Okay, well, that was, uh, that was after your mid-morning. You had your Zoom meeting at 10. After lunch, you were sitting around, you didn't have anything else till four, so you masturbated, you jacked off, you jilled off, you just watched a little bit of porn, but now you're in bed, and you did your prayers, and you did the prayer call with the pastor, and da 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 but now it's 11 o'clock at night, and you know what? You'd like an orgasm, and you feel a little tinge there, but man, I'm kind of stroking, or I'm, I'm, you know, rubbing my mouse, or I'm, you know, tossing whatever I'm doing here, and when I'm not really, oh, okay, let me get some more images. Why? Let me see if that will fill up my arousal tank. Why? because I don't want to get tennis elbow trying to do this thing, or, or, my, or I don't have a vibrator. And sometimes what we do is we say, okay, um, I can't get the arousal up, so I'll increase the stimulation. Let me get my vibrator. Okay, my vibrator. Now let me hold it harder. Let me put it on a higher speed. What am I doing? I'm trying to drive the stimulation up to get the release. So if I can't get the stimulation hard enough, I've got to increase the arousal by porn. If I can't get the arousal high enough, I've got to get the stimulation. Let me see what I got in the kitchen. Let me see what I can put inside. Let me see this. And you end up hurting yourself. You end up damaging something. Or let me see where I can stick this. Or let me see what I can do. Maybe if I take two towels and put them together. Or maybe if I take this. Or man, I think there was a, uh, an orange down in the refrigerator. Or, or what if I use this lotion or that lotion? What are you trying to do? You're trying to stoke your stimulation to get the feeling because your natural desire isn't there. 
but because the stimulation is there, now let me stoke the arousal through porn. And so it's in this place of people turning to porn in search of connection uh, for release. They want uh, to be someone in the picture. They want to be a character in the erotica. They want to either be the man there, the woman there, uh, the observer, the writer, the voyeur. Uh, they want to be the one dancing for someone or they want to be the one being danced for. They want to be the one giving the climax or they want to be the one uh, uh, being given the climax. And all these pursuits are associated with connection. What? I'm watching a scene and I either want to be one of the women making out with the other women, fondling the other woman. I want to be the man masturbating in the room while he's watching uh, the woman and his wife. Or I want to be the, the third eye, the camera that's watching the two or watching the couple or whatever it is. Or I want to be the man making the woman climax like that. Or I want to be the woman making the man climax like that. I want to be the guy whose uh, ejaculate spurts out like that. Or I want to be the woman who has that power. What am I doing? I'm inserting myself in a place reaching over, overreaching like Adam and Eve did in the garden. He said, here's you, here's all your trees, here's everything that's yours, enjoy it all you can. And they said, yeah, we'd like to reach over to what is not ours. And so porn now, in a place of isolation and disconnection, offers us simulated connection by which we can feel we're we're sexually engaged. I can feel like I'm the man. I can feel like I'm the person abusing the woman, being aggressive with her, smacking her or slapping her, or I can feel like the woman being abused. Or I can feel like I'm the man who's being dominated, or I can feel like I'm the woman who's dominating the man and giving out the commands. I'm seeking connection because connection is associated with release, but instead of speaking it spirit, soul, and body between me and the father as a single person, or spirit, soul, and body between me and the father and an equal human being who's on equal ground, I now seek it in a predatory sense that I want pleasure apart from personhood with no accountability, uh, with, uh, with one dimension, no taste, no touch, no smell, no behavior. I don't have to be nice to them. I don't have to do anything. But I want to pretend to have a synthetic stimulated connection in order to feel this release. And that is where porn, I feel, does not encompass, uh, in, embody God's best. Um, when we seek the pleasure of release but we don't feel aroused, we turn to porn. When we feel isolated or rejected, we turn to porn. When we crave diversion, I'm just bored, we turn to porn. When we're just like, man, ain't nothing else going on, might as well jerk off, might as well do this, we turn to porn. And now in this shelter in place, whereas normally we have fruitful lives, productive lives, human interaction, we get rewarded by talking to people, interacting, having fun, laughter, we play a sport, we work out, all the other things God gave us to fill in life, those things are taken away, and it's basically the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We're left with what food can we consume? I don't want to be eat a bunch of food. I can't have any more Oreos. I can't do any more chips. I can't do any more soda. God, if I have any food, I can die. So what do we do now? We go to porn. But unlike food, where we only have what's in our refrigerator or what we can get from Grubhub, porn says, what else would you like? Would you like to see threesomes? Would you like to see bi uh, bisexual? Would you like to see simulated rape? Would you like to see massage parlors? What would you like to see? What is your pleasure today? And it offers you this thing. But remember, it's going to take a dollar from you and give you back 90 cents. So that same scene, that same idea, it lasts you for a while, but now it doesn't do it. I've seen all the lesbian stuff. I've seen all the missionary stuff. I've seen all the big booty stuff. What else can I get? Oh, here's a, here's a young girl. Here's a teenage. Oh, teenage girl does this. Oh, here's a, uh, now you get into predatory. Here's a stepfather and stepdaughter thing. Or, or now, oh, what do I have over here? Oh, this is an officer arresting somebody. Or what do I have here? Oh, this is a cheating person. Oh, I'm going to watch. Why? I have got to insert myself in this because connection and release are tied. But because I don't have connection between a real person or I don't have connection between me and the father, I now accept this simulated connection. And even if you're not... Uh, 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 single in dealing with this. You can be in shared boredom as a couple, mm -hmm. a shared boredom um, uh, where you can see connection, shared boredom with a spouse, or acquaintance, or even a stranger. Hey, nothing else going on. How can we connect? I'm seeking release and I need uh, what God wants from me is dynamic connection, either as an individual between me and him or in a covenant relationship in a complex way. Um, and so now sometimes couples can condition their sexual release to simulated connection. That now Connie and I, we watch porn together. We would not watch porn together. We've never watched porn together. Um, I don't think we ever have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we watch porn together. What do we do? Well, let's see. And, and maybe she can pretend to be somebody in the scene. Or maybe I can think of somebody else, her as somebody else in the scene. Or maybe uh, when we have real sex later, I'll be thinking of her as the maid. And she can be thinking of me as uh, the hotel guy who was masturbating when she walked in. So now we're in a complex connection, but drawing others in. Uh, uh, into our relationship. And so now it's almost in, a, in an inequitable um, 
broken polyamorous way. Nothing against if you, polyamorous community or whatever. I'm talking about from a Christ-honoring perspective. I'm not talking about consenting adults with them. I'm talking about from the Christ-honoring perspective. These women that I'll be thinking of, their breasts, their booties, or whatever, the way they shake, the way they do this, or they're uh, more melanin or less melanin or whatever it is, the way I'm thinking of that in my mind, they're not, that woman's not an equal in our relationship. If she's thinking of, uh, uh, of a red, yellow, brown, black, white guy with a thicker, fatter penis or more muscles or whatever, that man is not an equal in our relationship. We are dipping into their lives, taking from them, apart from their personhood, absorbing and, and uh, um, appropriating that for our pleasure. We're the ones that are in covenant with each other. We're the ones that would die for each other. We're the ones that would lay down our lives for each other. But for people, we do nothing for at all. That means we'll just take this from you and take this from you. Not only does it dishonor God, it dishonors you, and it dishonors who you belong to. And well, Connie and I will just take that because we would like that. So now Connie and I are dishonoring each other because internally I'm connected with the double D breasts uh, on, uh, in the nipple rings on the camera. Internally, she's connected with the super muscular guy or whatever with a 10 inch penis or whatever. That's internally. And, and with our eyes closed, instead of using our hands to bring pleasure, she's using my penis externally while attaching somebody else to it internally. I'm using her vagina externally while attaching somebody else into it internally. And we're not even present with each other. And what the devil says, oh, that's great sex. But I tell you what, that also has diminishing returns. And then couples begin to split and go in a different direction where she wants a little more of this and I want a little more of that. And then she wants she wants to see a little more. And I'm like, why is she focused on that? And why is Mike always looking at over the lesbians? And, and why does he want this? I notice he picks all young girls. And I notice she picks all super hung guys. Or I notice uh, she, you know, uh, she wanted to switch over to the bisexual, but she didn't want to tell me that this was what she wanted to watch. And I'm ashamed. So now we're watching on our own in shame because... Uh, the novelty is wearing off and we've seen this and we've seen that and we've seen this and we've seen that and now we start to get back a dollar. We, we put a dollar, we only got 90 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents, 60 cents, 50 cents, but, and now all of a sudden our very real vagina and very real penis, which worked completely well not too long ago, doesn't work anymore. We're feeling disconnected. We're seeking outside connection, simulated connection, and then trying to stimulate ourselves enough and really what it can boil down to eventually is she's jilling off, I'm jacking off, and are, uh, we're getting quote unquote fulfilled uh, outside of each other. And now all of a sudden it's no longer complex. It's now a simulated connection, which really uh, uh, leads to unfulfillment. And somebody mm -hmm. said, well, how often are you having sex with each other? How often are you having sex where we're both present? How are you having sex where I'm not thinking of observing us from the outside and casting us as actors in porn? Okay. Not very much. Why? Because we've invited a simulated connection and we're connecting with people that are not real in a predatory manner. Uh, uh, while trying to get the outlet. I mean, she might as well be a toy. I might as well be a dildo. She might as well be a vibrating sleeve or something like that. Why? Because not only am I not engaging with the personhood of the people in porn, I'm no longer engaging with her and her personhood. Um, uh, porn in a marriage can never exist in the frame um, of equality. One partner will desire, typically one partner desires and nudges the other partner and the other partner gives in. Okay, I'll watch it or I'll do it or we can. And that usually opens up a door for what else can we do? And now maybe we could just do this. And now maybe we could just do this. And I don't want you to open up yourself to that. God doesn't want you to open up yourself to that. You need to reset the factory settings and say, you know what, God, I, need to, I, I, I just need to go 30 days and reset myself to what is real and authentic instead of what is simulated. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I've covered that last part. Um, is that it? That's last okay, step. so here's my conclusion. Um, somebody says, yeah, but I like it. I like porn. I like, I mean, the orgasm I have from porn, and I had, listen, I have masturbated to porn. Uh, I have masturbated to, since I felt rejected by Connie one day. I wanted to have sex. It tapped me on the shoulder. I don't know if you remember this. It was early when we mm -hmm. lived. Tapped me on the shoulder, and she was like, I got to go. I think we just had a baby or whatever. She was like, I got to go. I got to do this and that. And I'm standing there. She leaves for work. I'm a wreck standing in the thing. And I just flipped on some channels and found what I could find there on, our, on demand and jerked off right in, the, uh, right in our bedroom. And I think, man, what did I just go from 30 to to 14 again, what just happened? Because I wanted connection associated with release. I got rejection and my mind instantly knew where to connect because the ladies on the show, not only are they job to show, is their job to show me their bodies, their job is to affirm that through their lustful gaze and through their response on that camera, that it's okay that I'm seeing them this way. Their eyes, their bodies, their sounds, it says to me, this is good. And they allow me, the reason they show penises and stuff in porn is not so that hetero men would say, oh man, I want that. That's not why they show it. They show it so that men can pretend that that's what they're doing to the woman, that they are that guy giving that thing. 
uh, uh, and I, inst- I was amazed at how quickly the rejection that I felt from her that I, uh, that I, that I didn't just want to masturbate in the context of, of what I had between her and I, but I masturbated in the context of seeking connection to a human place. Why? Because while she was closed to me sexually, the woman on the television, the women on the television were saying, we're open. And so someone says, but I like it, it feels good. But listen, I like it, it feels good, goes against um, the Christ, Christ-honoring truths. It goes against the truth that we know from Christ, and it goes against the truth that we know uh, from our human connection, the truth that we know of what it means to honor one another. And I'm telling you, it will leave you empty. I, I don't prophesy the curse over you. I don't prophesy, I'm not saying you'll lose your ability to get erection or you'll ruin your marriage, but man, you gotta talk, you gotta communicate. And as a single person, I'm not saying if you masturbate, your life will go wrong. You'll never be able to be satisfied in a marriage. But I'm going to tell you what, if you go through life as a connoisseur and, you know, I like women that do this and women that do that and a woman does this and a woman does that, you're not ready for a spouse. Because when you connect with a woman, you're dealing with a real human being with fears and dreams and hopes and, 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 and ideas and a will and sovereignty and equality. They're not somebody you can mold and manipulate for your sexual lust. But I will tell you what, if you will connect dynamically and get free between yourselves, alone, naked in the Garden of Eden, just with you and God, Connie and I have sex that is unlike anything I've ever seen in any porn. And I've never seen a woman climax or enjoy sex as much as I see my own wife do. And to be, and I realize I have the real thing, that these are real breasts in my hand. This is a real woman that I'm touching. And it's so much better than... It, you know what it does? It's appreciating returns because I, I, it's, it's done knowing that it's affirmed. It's done knowing that it's in the light. It's done knowing that the person there is connected to me all the way around and that we are connected and committed to each other. And uh, that's where it's fulfilled. And as a single person, I remember being a single Christian and, and struggling with masturbation. Should I or should I not? Nobody ever told me God loved me regardless. Nobody ever told me that I wasn't going to lose my salvation every time I did it. And once I realized God is with me, no matter what, he's not going to leave me or forsake me, and I'm still saved because I'm under a covenant of grace, not a covenant of law. Though I was able to say, you know what, God, I did this, and I need you to help me with it. And I'm going to do it as unto you, and I need you to take the desire away or help me channel it. And every time my thoughts would wander, I would say, Father, I'm not going to think about that. And as soon as I got free, I remember there was like a three or four year period in my life when I was like, it's like when I realized, you know what, God loves me, and, and, and no matter how many times I sin, I cannot sin away the mercy of God. It was like the desire just left me. It was the condemnation that empowered it in my life. And that was about from maybe age 19 to about 23, and then around 24, 25, I, I remember slipping back into it again, and I would masturbate once a month, and then some, it would be a period, it would be six, time, six months, it would be like once a week, and then I would stop for a while. But it was an ongoing struggle, and I finally realized... You know, I didn't land on Plymouth Rock. It landed on me. This was thrown at me. This was opened up to me. God, how do I take this brokenness, like pastor, my pastor was teaching on Sunday, and channel it in a way that honors you? And I, I don't know if I do it 100%. I walk with a limp. I, 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 sometimes I'm having sex with Connie. We've actually had this happen where I've stopped in the middle because I've told her, look, my mind went to another place. My, my, mind, my mind is in a place and I don't want to use you in that way. Or we need to switch positions. And I would say, stop, 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 stop. I need to refocus. Why? Because these ghosts, these images, I'm like, I feel like a lot sometimes. The Bible says that righteous man uh, um, vexed his righteous soul from day to day through the things that he saw and that he heard. There are echoes of things uh, that, I've, that I've seen and I've heard. And it's interesting because Connie's had so many partners, so many penises, so many places that she's been. And I think you don't have any echoes or memories of that. No, I mean you I can tell. To, that no, I'm saying I don't have to deal with having a flash or a, you know how you said I see something from something I saw in porn and I have to tell you to you know let's change up the position. I don't deal with that, and I'm so grateful. But it's because your past not, was not sexual. Time, yeah. It was not sexual. What you were you were in rooms with naked people doing sexual things, but you were not tying the sexual no. part. You're you were dealing with a soul emptiness and a brokenness. Now that that's filled in, you're not looking back on any guys going, man, no. he sure was nice. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I never have to deal with a desire of somebody from my past or a, a longing or a, you know, a comparison because, like Mike said, it was not sexual. It was not arousal. It was not uh, lust. It was brokenness and emptiness and trying to fill whatever brokenness in me with the attention of guys and I'm so grateful that this is where I share and 
I'm so grateful also for a husband who may have the things that he's dealt with in his past to be able to be honest about it and to be able to share or say, this is what I'm dealing with, or this is, you know, to be able to say that thing he said about when we first, you know, were early on in our marriage and uh, I had just had the baby and everything. He came to me and we talked about it. And this is what I would encourage you if you're married, open, honest communication is going to improve and multiply the intimacy that you're able to share with the real person that you have right yeah. in your own bed. Yeah, and, and it, it's not easy. It's yeah. not easy. And, you know, we went through a period of a number of years ago uh, where there was just a real tearing in our relationship. A lot of wounds, a lot of tender, uh, just a really rough patch. And, and marriages go through that, seasons of where they burn hot and, and close and intense and sometimes they're separate. And I remember I came to her and said, look, I, you know, I, I masturbated here and there and this and that. And um, I don't want to say there's not an excuse. It's, I'm not even looking for an excuse. Um, fear is a terrible thing. Don't ever underestimate what people mm -hmm. will do when they're afraid or isolated or alone. Um, and, and to say, you know, this is what I've done and this and this. And she didn't freak out. You know, you didn't know, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for telling me. Um, we don't, we're not. I think, a, I think a spouse would want that. It doesn't mean that there's not pain, you know, mm -hmm. and his situation, you know, was not one of things that we've counseled people through before where real stronghold dealing yeah. with yeah. porn and, yeah. you know, things like that. And that is not anything we've had to deal with in that regard. We have talked and counseled to people who really have a stronghold and there's a lot of hurts and pains and mistrusts that come out of that but the communication and the open honest dialogue is what's going to help see you through that yeah and and know this we don't well, i'm gonna end where we started we don't want to empower the curse in your life mm -mm. you're not beneath us the holy ghost dwells in you god dwells in you well, i've got an addiction i've got that well then the greater one is on the inside of you and and it, get help do what you got to do but don't bow your knee to the idea that you're permanently damaged and cannot overcome this don't, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing in the world. It is not. Oh my gosh, I've been so betrayed. Listen, they that are whole need not the physician, but they that are sick. Before repentance, there's healing. This is what we were talking about on Sunday, brokenness. What my pastor was talking about, brokenness. What is it that they're craving? Is it rejection? Is it attention? Is it affirmation? Do they feel cold? Do they feel distant? We're so easy to label. My husband betrayed me. My wife betrayed me. She this and this. Listen, porn is a very interesting middle ground. Well, it's still adultery. Theoretically, it is adultery. Uh, you know, according to scripture, you've lusted and you've committed adultery, but it's not adultery, adultery. And I don't mean that to belittle that. In the sense of absolute sense, yes, looking at a woman on a beach and saying, she has a nice butt, or looking at a man on the beach and saying, man, he's got nice shoulders, or uh, I saw in the, the guy we were... I forget where we were, and the guy had that banana hammock on, and you could see the whole, like, uh, yeah, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you, you know, you say, oh, man, th that's not, you know, lusting after that. Well, okay, that is inappropriate, or thinking in, my, in your mind, you know, that Ryan Reynolds, he's sure is a, you know, he, uh, like a filet mignon or whatever it is, uh, whatever, whatever it is she thinks. Uh, um, well, yeah, okay, that is theoretically, according to Matthew, adultery. Um, but that's not the same thing as inviting someone else in. Uh, in that way. I'm not belittling it, but I want you to know that, oh, porn is the ultimate betrayal. It's not the ultimate betrayal. And we got to stop making it the ultimate betrayal. It's people that are wrestling with desires that God put in. Porn offers an easy way to fake, stoke arousal that does not exist naturally so that it can support stimulation to get the desired outcome. And when a person seeks connection or feels isolated or bored or detached, porn is always warm and welcoming. And approach it from that. Don't approach it from you're evil or you're bad. Approach it from what is it that you're seeking out of this that we need to figure out by God to way to get it in a healthier way. And I, I'm not blaming the wife or the husband. Well, he, you know, he wouldn't eat my peach. I tried to get him to read your book, Pastor Mike, Pastor Connie, and he wouldn't do it. He said he didn't like vaginas and he didn't like my vagina and all this other kind of stuff. So I just started watching porn. Well, I, 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 I don't condemn you. I don't think what you're doing is right, but I don't condemn you. I think you should stop, but I don't condemn you. I don't prophesy negativity over you, but I don't think you should do it. 
but is it really porn that you're after? Or is it a connection and a pleasure that comes from the connection and the value? And porn is saying, I've got something for you, but it really doesn't. It's gonna take your dollar and give you back 90 cents, then 80, then 70, and then you'll rub your clit as hard as you can until it bleeds and you won't be able to get the feeling that you get because porn is not real, it's not authentic, it's not dynamic. And so I'm not shaming you for reading erotica or for thinking about someone else. You're a sexual being that's yearning to express it in connection and porn offers you kind of a middle ground. You don't have to cheat on your husband, you don't have to cheat on your wife, you don't have to destroy another family, but I can bring you connection and make you feel warm and invited and accepted as a sexual being, but it's not real. And I would much rather you, A, learn to masturbate as a single person in the presence of God, in the absence of others, in a generic sexual being context without being predatory. But as a married person, I'd encourage you to honor your spouse. Mm -hmm. And if you're masturbating, you masturbate in agreement, you masturbate focused on each other, you masturbate by permission, but you don't ever masturbate as an excuse or a substitution for connecting. Well, our dynamic connection is so screwed up, I'd just rather him jerk off than bother me with it. That's brokenness, and you gotta get before God and say, Father, help put us back together. Well, I, I don't care what she does, as long as she's not bothering me, that's fine. That's, that's an abdication of your responsibility. That is theft against your own spouse. These are very deep things. I think maybe we've gotten into deeper things than we yeah. need to, but uh, Connie, why don't you close? Well, yeah. Two quick things. Um, one, if you're having difficulty connecting with your spouse, maybe desiring or, you know, uh, one spouse may say, you know, I'm not interested or they're apathetic towards it. I would look to see if you have feeding sources other places, meaning is porn feeding that lust and giving you an outlet outside of your spouse, the real person that be you Be honest. Haven't. Be honest. It can be Instagram. It can be Kylie Jenner, peace be under her, I don't have a problem with her, but pictures. It doesn't have to be hardcore porn. It can be GQ magazine. I realized I got GQ magazine and all these other oh, things. And I said, I Connie, yeah. yeah, I said, Connie, I don't want these in my life because I like the clothes. I like this. But seeing these women, it does something for me. And you just got to be honest about that. And it's going to be around you all the time. Coming in your eyes and ears, beaches. You just go out in places. We got everybody around here in the yoga pants and whatever else. I know a butt when I see one. I know a shapely woman when I see one. I know young, vibrant uh, bodies when I see one. I'm not always going, oh my gosh, I cast down the devil. I cast down the devil. I bind you, Satan. I just have to be honest to make sure that, A, I don't stoke in one place and outlet another. B, that I don't project. C, that I don't steal. D, that I'm aware. And E, that I'm content with my portion. These are complex things to manage. Um, but be honest about, I just can't control it. Find the feeding ground. Say, and if you don't know where it is, say, Lord, where am I, where, where am I, where's the gasoline coming on this thing? Go ahead. Okay. The other thing is that if porn is something that you're dealing with and you, you know, maybe you and your spouse have talked about before and you've promised, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, don't allow the enemy to put fear and condemnation in your mind that you say, if I come forward with it you know, yeah. this is, is going to happen. Um, I think that sometimes isolates you and even uh, keeps you and your husband or wife further apart. And if you're going to have true intimacy, oneness, sharing, you know, uh, sexually together in a pure uh, way, you have to come forward with that or you have to share it. And it may not be easy and I get that. But I think sometimes the enemy tries to isolate us sure. to say, you know, keep that from them because you don't want what's going to come out on the other side. And I just encourage you yeah. to, that God give you the strength and, you know, the words to be able to share and um, that your spouse is there walking this out with you. And the other thing is to say, if I go to my spouse and say, you know, Connie, I masturbate or I watch porn. Okay. Then uh, six months later, then a year later, at some point, I don't want you to see me as a failure. And that's a big thing, mm -hmm. I think, for a husband or a wife. Very I see so. my I see myself as a sucky, horrible failure, and now I'm going to open myself up to see you as a failure, or for you to yes. see me as a failure. Um, but that's not who we are. Mm -mm. That's not who we are. We're born again. We're redeemed from the curse.
Christ is in us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And that's not the sum total of who we are. How do you ride that balance of no shame, but also to resist it and to, to agree with God's perspective on it? That's what this teaching is about. As you renew your mind, you'll find that porn is incompatible with who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. And as you see these men and women through God's eyes, you won't hate them, belittle them, or shame them, but you also won't prey upon them. You'll cover rather than uncover mm. and exploit. That's good. And that's the deeper thing. We don't want to give you fear of consequences or prophesy negativity to you. We don't want to give you a green light and say it's no big deal. We want you to renew your mind. That's what this teaching was about, to try to maybe inject some Christ perspective. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, something that was said yes. um, takes root and that you're just blessed and encouraged. Uh, don't give yourself over. Um, um, reel it all back in between you and the Father as a single person and you, the Father, and your spouse as a married person. That's where it's truly fulfilling. That's where it's appreciating returns instead of diminishing returns. Um, anything else? No, we just love you very much. Thank you for, you know, just taking the time to hear this. You may know somebody that's dealing with it. I encourage you to share it with them, you know, maybe send them the link or whatever. Um, this is a subject that most people shy away from or don't talk about, and it's so needed. The reason why Mike and I do these teachings or share or, you know, come on here is because we know that there's people dealing with it and our heart is if there's anything we can do to help, to bring healing, to bring wholeness, that's what we want to do. We love you more than you know. God yes. loves you. And um, listen, we're just all walking it out. Just keep turning yourself towards the light. Keep turning yourself towards the light. Father, do in me, through me, what needs to be done. Renew me. Renew my view of myself, renew my view of sex, renew my view of other people, renew my view of my spouse. Uh, just restore and renew me. Uh, sit with the physician uh, and let him lead you into change and lead you into repentance and affirm, show you and highlight why you keep going back to the same well for water and it doesn't fulfill mm -hmm. you. Um, but know that he's, he's there with you. Um, and thank God for grace. Yes. Thank God. Peace on you and yours. Love Health you. and light. You are blessed. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. Good night.